pleasant day for everyone. We had given a task in reporting concerning the global divides, the North and the South. So, let me introduce first my members, Francis John Cortez, Axel Drake Estrelon, Kesa Dihon, and I, Daisy Me Elias. Now, our objectives are define the term global south, differentiate the global south from the third world, and analyze how the Philippines fits into the definition of the global south with emphasis on Mindanao. Global divides the north and the south. Um, it is generally defined as the gap between the wealthy industrialized country and the poor developing countries, which create inequalities in various dimensions and regions. Global divides ay karaniwang tumutukoy bilang ang agwat sa pagitan ng mayayamang industrialisadong bansa at ng mahihirap na umuunlad na bansa. Na lumilikha naman ng mga hindi pagkakapantay-pantay sa iba't ibang dimension at rehiyon. Global South, it refers broadly to the regions of Latin America, Asia, Africa, and Oceania. It is one of the family terms including third world and periphery that denote regions outside Europe and North America. The Global South comprised of Third World, which is poor but communist, so that we, Philippines, considered as Third World. Global North It is generally accepted as the economically developed and wealth countries. In Wallerstein terminology, the Global North make up the core countries. So, ang Global North comprised of First World and most of all Second World. So, sabi ko nga kanina, ang Global South is comprised of Third World, which is Mahirap but Communist. S while the Global North, First World, and Second World are the developed and, and industrialized countries, such as Japan, Korea, China, America, and so on, which considered as wealthy countries. While the dividing line is commonly based on economic measures, other measures of the gap between nations are Human Development Report by the United Nations Development Program, the bottom billion, and the global digital divide. First, I will discuss the Human Development Report by the United Nations Development Program. Wealth and well-being reveals that the rich one-fifth of the world's population consume 86% of all the world's goods and services, while the poorest one-fifth consume just 1.3%. So, 30 years ago, there was massive inequality in the most basic aspects of life. Many children didn't survive their first years or have any education, while richer population have much greater access to university education and much better health than older ages. So just like here in our city, this is just an example of, it, of inequality. I know some of you here experience this thing like pag may namimigay, may ipamimigay ang gobyerno na ayuda, kadalasang nakakatanggap ay yung mga may kaya sa buhay dahil sila yung mga may kakilala sa gobyerno sila yung napapriority dahil nga mayayaman habang yung mga mahihirap naman hindi na pagtutuunan ng pansin kasi nga wala silang kakilala sa gobyerno Next is the bottom billion Bottom billion are those countries with the majority of its population have experienced little to no income growth since the 1980s and 1990s, make up what Peter Collier. 
It's a majority of 58 countries concentrated in Africa and Central Asia where about a billion people live in the economies have been stagnating for more than 40 years. So instead of converging with the other countries, they're moving further away, creating this huge current divergence. According to the author, these countries cannot get out of this situation on their own because they are one of the so-called poverty traps which are very difficult to overcome. We can understand them as a series of difficulties that cause the lack of capacity to grow and the stagnation of their economies. The last one is the digital divide within countries refers to the inequalities in access to the technology among the citizens. This can be explained as the difference in the use of technology and access to IT. It creates an equal education as some have limited or no access to equipment like hardware, software, and IT support. Schools with smaller budget, lack of IT support, and unreli unreliable equipment means that students aren't provided with the same learning of opportunities. Okay, uh, good day everyone. Now let's tackle all about the ASEAN Digital Divide. Okay, so according from an integrating article about the adoptions of the digital transformation of the ASEAN member centuries, that internet penetration is high in countries such as Brunei, Malaysia, and Singapore, but less developed in Col uh, Cambodia, Indonesia, Lao PDR, and Myanmar, where approximately 70% of the population have no internet access at all. So, pinapakita po dito na mahina po yung internet penetration po sa Cambodia, Indonesia, and Lao PDR, and Myanmar po. Now, also, high internet uh, connectivity is critical in the ASEAN since it is the pre-request from engaging the program digital economy. And that is according from the ASEAN post in 2019. Okay? Considering the various from a uh, form of divide, Numerate above the double divide is created by the political power, which is colonial legacies, democratic influence, and also economic dependence are including uh, core therapy, uh, relations, foreign debt, and etc. And resource of information or exportation, including trending relations, availability of resource, and etc. Now, the use of phrase Global South marks as a shift from a central focus on the development of a, a cultural difference towards an emphasis of geopolitical relationship of the power. Okay? The term Global South functions as more than a metaphor for underdevelopment. It, is, uh, it refers to the entire history of colonialism, neo-imperialism, and different economic and social change through which large inequalities in living standard, life expectancy, and access resource maintain. <coughs> so, ang paggamit ng salitang Global South, guys, ay nagmamarka ng pagbabago mula sa isang sentral na nagbibigay din sa pag-unlad o pagka, uh, pagkakaiba ng kultura tungo sa isang geopolitical na relasyon ng kapangyarihan. Okay? Ang terminong Global South ay gumaganap bilang higit pa sa isang metapora para sa ilalim ng pag-uunlad. Now, tinutukoy rin nito ang buong kasaysayan ng kolonyalismo, neo-imperialismo, at pagkakaiba ng pagbabago sa ekonomiya ng panlipunan na kung saan ay may malaking hindi, uh, may malaking hindi pagkakapantay-pantay ng pamumuhay ang mga pamuntayan like pag-asa sa buhay at pag-assess ng mga mapagkukunan na napapanatili. Okay? So, since the late 20th century, a research and scholarly institute have been established that focus on the Global South. Scholar from the Global South Study Center GSS, uh, GSSC of the University of Colony in Germany proposed that the term of Global South is significantly more favorable than its uh, predecessor. No? 
third world or developing world because it acknowledged the historical context behind the underdevelopment of this religion. Okay? So, uh, since late 20th century daw, no, na itatag ang mga research at scholar institute na nakatutok sa pandaigdigang timog or should I say global south. Katulad na lang ng mga scholar mula sa global south uh, studies uh, center or GSSC no, ng Universidad ng Colony in Germany ay nagmumungkahi o ng term ng Global South ay makabulang mas pabor kaysa sa nauna nito or should I think Third World or Developing World <laughs> dahil kinikilala nito ang uh, historical na konsepto sa likod ng underdevelopment na relihiyong ito and yun lang po yung tungkol sa ASEAN Digital Divide Thank you! In the now and the conflict trap, the armed rebellion waged by separatist groups like the MNLF and MILF had always stoked Mindanao since the 1970s. Of course, the Mindanao's claim for independence and sovereignty, which dates back to the Spanish colonization, is another much longer story. So, since 1970s, mga separatista like mga MNLF at MILF ay siyang mga armadong naghihimagsik na palaging nag-uudyok dito sa Mindanao. Ang BARM, noong Marso 2019 ay formal na pinanyayaan. Ito ay ang pinakahuling pagsisikap ng gobyernong Pilipinas nasupuin ang kaguluhan sa Mindanao. So, there are traps introduced by Paul Collier upang isaalang-alang ang kahirapan sa mga mahihirap nating bansa. Sapagkat, ang Mindanao nga ay nagtatala ng karamihan sa pinakamataas na antas na kahirapan sa bansa. Using the lens of Collier, Four traps ay nararapat na suriin lamang ang sitwasyon sa ating rehiyon. Ang mga traps na ito ay ibabahagi ni Kesa Dihon. So, let's go deeper to the conflict trap. One of the example of the con conflict trap is low income. Civil war reduces income and at the same time, that low income heightens the risk of war. On the second point, this is where Collier focuses on the fact that the poorer the country is, the higher the risk of civil war. The second is the natural resources trap. This is a kind of resource trap wherever you have bountiful resources. But despite of having bountiful natural resources, there is a stagnation in economic activities that can be seen. This is a situation where a country specializes in one of the activities. So let's say oil is one of the activities that the country is engaged in. Venezuela and Angola are good examples which are oil-bestowed nations. Now, these nations have been developing exceptionally for oil, but what can be seen in the long run is that there has been economic stagnation despite of the fact that there has been ample of oil drill that have been seen. Why? There have been numerous reasons for it and one of the obvious, obvious reasons that we can understand is what if the source is non-renewable? It would come to an end on one day and that point of the time, countries would not have ample of resources and ample of other activities in which it has been involved and therefore economic stagnation is very obvious. So the third of Collier's trap is the trap of being landlocked. It occurs when a country is resource scarce and has poor transportation links to the cost, either through its own fault or through having the bad luck of having neighbors with poor infrastructures. Without access to a cost, countries have difficulties integrating into global markets. 
for countries that cannot access to the cost, the most they can hope for, says Collier, is relying on their neighbors for growth. However, when their neighbors are similarly trapped in one of the four traps, development is next to impossible. The last one is the bad governance trap. Bad governance trap in a small country can also trap a country in poverty. The qualifier of a small country is necessary here, argues Collier, who provides Bangladesh as an example of an economic success despite being the most corrupt country in the world. In small countries, the government necessarily plays a larger role in guiding economic development. However, when small governments that supposed to be guiding economic development are instead corrupt or have bad policies, development will not occur. Further, the prospects of a country turning around its policies is low, with a country having only a 1.9% chance of having a sustained turnaround in any given year, which such a low percentage, a country is truly trapped. So hello guys, so I will continue our reporting assigned to me which the Bandung Conference. So this article I will be tackle about Bandung Conference where everyone can talk about what happened during the book gathering. So Bandung Conference, also known as Asian African, which was the first gathering of independent historian and soon to be independent nations in Asia and Africa. In April 18 to 24, 1955, the delegates from 29 countries, Asia and Africa, were gathered in Bandung, Indonesia to discuss the peace and role uh, of the Third World Cold War. So, economic development and decolonization. So, the Bandung was organized by Indonesia, Burma, Myanmar, India, uh, Ceylon, Sri Lanka, and Pakistan. So coordinated also by Ruslan Abdul Ghani, a Secretary General of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Indonesia. So ang leaders ng iba't ibang country ay nagtipok-tipok upang matuldukan ang susi o punto sa kasaysayan ng mga umuunlad na bansa na nagbubunga na di nahanay nakilusan o tinatawag na nam. The core principles of Bandung Conference. So this issue, uh, these issues were the center importance to all participants in conf in the conference which had recently emerged from colonial rule. So the 29 delegates built upon the 10 principles of peaceful. So these are the following principles na nakikita nyo sa si screen. Sampung principles ang ginawa o napag-usapan ng mga leader para maunlad ang mga di, hindi pagkakaunawaan ng bawat panig. So, hindi ko na ito iisa-isahin discuss sa inyo sapagkat nababasa nyo na ang nakasaad ng principles, ay 10 principles. So, balit, nagbibigay ako ng brief summary upang maintindihan ninyo ang nakapaloob dito o kung anong napag-usapan sa loob ng meeting. So, ang sampung principles na ito ay nakapaloob lahat ng mga rules at regulation upang magkaroon ng pagkakaintindihan ang bawat bansa. So, ang bawat kalahok dito ang nasang ayunan para sa mga kabutihan ng bansa na kinilang ipinaglalaban dahil sa kawalan ng kalayaan. Ito ay para sa kalinawan ng lahat at magkaisa.